Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a Thanksgiving week edition of UCF football. Now, unfortunately, we have a monumental loss to talk about, but we do have a huge rivalry game to talk about this week as well. I'm Mike Bianchi, sports columnist of the Orlando Sentinel. You know who that man is right over there. That's our UCF insider, UCF beat writer, Jason Beatty of the Orlando Sentinel and Orlando Sentinel. Dot com. All right, Jason, monumental loss, 17 to 14. We have quarterback issues. John Rice Plumley plays in the first half. Then he gets benched for, we think, injury reasons in the second half. Mikey King comes in. Didn't matter. They lost the game 17 to 14. They had everything in front of them. They could have hosted an American Athletic Conference championship game. They could have won the conference. They could have gone to the Cotton Bowl. Now, all of that is in jeopardy. All right, let's talk about that, uh, Jason. Yeah, the loss to Navy was head scratching throughout the entire afternoon. It really felt like Navy controlled, you know, it controlled the time of possession. And they that game was played the way Navy wanted it to be played. I mean, they ran the ball successfully in the first half. They got enough points to win the game. Um, you know, UCF's defense made some adjustments in the second half and uh, unfortunately for UCF, the Knights just couldn't get going on offense and, and protect their quarterback, Mikey Keene. Uh, did it ruin the season? You, you kind of have to say yes, it did, because like you mentioned, had they won that game and beaten USF this week, you know, they would be in a position to host the title game. And, you know, generally when you host the title game, you have that home field advantage, you know, how tough it is to win at the bounce house these days, uh, or maybe not anymore, but back in the day, I guess it was, but uh you know, you'd think if you win that title game at home, you go to the Cotton Bowl. And a lot of that is is now well out of control for UCF. Yeah, Jason, I wrote a column after the game. I, I think it's the costliest loss in UCF history when you take into account everything that was on the line. The conference championship game, hosting that. Um, the Cotton Bowl, which would have been worth $6 million had UCF been able to make that. Even if they get to the conference championship game and win it now, I don't know if they're going to get that Cotton Bowl bid or not. Um, I was asking Mark Daniels, the voice of UCF, uh, earlier this week about it. And he said he couldn't think of a loss that was costlier. Is this the worst loss in UCF, at least recent history? Yeah, it's certainly up there. I mean, uh, and I think any time you have a loss that truly takes you out of con contention for the American Athletic Conference Championship, that really hurts. This one didn't entirely take them out. But obviously, it, it made it really challenging. We'll get into that later in the show. But it, it's it's certainly up there. I mean, you talk about the way UCF lost to the Navy last year, 34 to 30 on the road. And this this year, 17 to 14 at home on senior day as well. Uh, it's it's up there for sure. In front of an unbelievable crowd. That crowd showed up early, 11 a.m. kickoff. And that was that was maybe the best crowd of the year. Yeah, it was it was a good crowd. They they honored the seniors, and unfortunately, the game just didn't work out the way UCF wanted it to. All right, let's talk about the quarterback situation. As we mentioned, John Rice Plumley, he was eleven of eighteen, one hundred and seven yards, one interception, only ran twice for seven yards. I guess he banged up his shoulder, according to Gus Malzahn. Wasn't throwing the ball very well. Tried to throw a hail mary at the end of the half. It was way short. They pull John Rice Pumley. Gus Malzahn puts in Mikey Keene, who who got a spark going early in the early in the second half. Drove him right down for a touchdown, but then he was ineffective as well. Jason, do we have a quarterback controversy now? I don't think you still have one. Uh, Gus kind of set the record straight on Monday, basically saying if John Rice is healthy, he's UCF starting quarterback. Uh, that's that's kind of what we learned previously when he went down with the head injury. He came back after Mikey started against Memphis. John Rice returned to the field for Tulane. Um, you know, if, if Mikey had continued that that second half performance following his first touchdown pass and, and really put up a bunch of points and they won the game, maybe and maybe there would be a quarterback controversy. But because he was really ineffective after that first drive where he went three for three, 79 yards and the touchdown pass to Javon Baker, um, after that I think he was like five of 12 for – you know, 80 yards or something like that. So it, I don't think there's enough from Mikey's performance in the second half for really to be there a controversy entering USF. 
right after the uh, the game against Navy, when 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 Gus was explaining why he pulled John Rice Plumley, at first I thought, oh, he's just protecting him because he doesn't want to you know make the kid look bad. But but now I really do think JRP is injured, and I wondered if he's I, I wonder if he's going to play against USF. I really do. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, you know, we obviously don't know everything that happens in a practice. And I, I guess John Rice, you know, got hit or or fell on his shoulder. Maybe when he was trying to get that that fourth down pass from Isaiah Bowser at Tulane, I, I guess he fell on his shoulder there or another time in the game. I mean, you have to wonder if he wasn't 100 percent healthy, why they even start him in the first place? Um, knowing I mean, everyone knew Navy's past defense. Uh, you know, wasn't as good. And Navy's rush defense was one of the best in the country. So knowing that you probably would want to go pass heavy from the jump, but we all know Mikey Keene's a stronger passer, right? John Rice is the more mobile quarterback. I think everyone agrees with that. So it's interesting to see how injured is John Rice Palmley and whether or not he plays at USF. All right, let's talk about the AAC uh, championship game scenarios. Obviously, best case scenario for UCF, uh, they beat USF. That's a given. They need to do that. But then they would need Tulsa to beat Houston. And if Tulsa upsets Houston this coming weekend, then UCF makes the title game should they beat USF. But if Houston wins the game as they should, then we go into a three-way tiebreaker between the loser of the Tulane-Cincinnati game, UCF, and then Houston. All right, explain that scenario to me. Yeah, so it's ironic that UCF's going to want Tulsa to win. And you talk about all those tough losses to Tulsa over the year for UCF, but that's one That's one way. That's, that's probably the cleanest way UCF uh, can make it to the title game, like you mentioned. Another thing that UCF fans need to pay attention to is Tuesday night, uh, you know, we're, the show is going to be out after this, but uh, the CFP rankings have a little bit of an impact. If UCF remains in the rankings, that could potentially have an impact if they beat USF. That is unlikely. Again, we don't know the CFP rankings until they come out. So assuming UCF and Houston aren't ranked in the CFP, Tulane and Cincinnati remain ranked. The loser of that Tulane and Cincinnati game would be in a three-way tie with UCF and Houston. Assuming UCF beats USF, and Houston beats Tulsa, which you'd think they would. Tulsa not very good this season, although they did put a lot of points up last week. Uh, but if that happens, those results hold. It would go back to computer ratings. So remember the BCS, Mike? Basically, yes. there's a bunch of computer ratings that are still around. UCF fans probably know the Collie Matrix very well. It's the Collie Matrix. It's the Anderson and Hester, the Billingsley, and another one. I'm forgetting the name, but there's a four or five Wolf. computer ratings. I think it's Wolf. And the Wolf ratings, thank you. So it's four or five computer ratings. They they take the average of those computer ratings, and the the team that's ranked the highest goes to the title game. So ironically, UCF really needs Tulsa to beat Houston. Otherwise, it's up to the computers, and who knows from there. All right, so say worst-case scenario happens. UCF doesn't make the conference title game. Um, what's their bowl prospects? Obviously, the Cotton Bowl – uh, would be out. That's a big drop from where they would with that where, where they would go then, is it not? Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, Yahoo Sports and ESPN, uh, they they both like UCF going to the Fenway Bowl uh, against ACC opponents. Uh, you know, Wake Forest, Syracuse. You know, ESPN has another projection: the Armed Forces Bowl against Kansas. That would be at least a Big Twelve preview of sorts. I thought the 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 toughest. Uh, one for UCF fans to swallow would be going back to the Cure Bowl against Western Kentucky. That's what Brett McMurphy had. That seems a bit harsh to me, but look, that's the reality of what is in the American when you don't make your title game. Just some bad bowl bits. Who did UCF lose to in the Cure Bowl in McKenzie Milton's first year where they booed McKenzie Milton off the field? Arkansas State. That was Arkansas where Terry State. Mah- where Terry Mahasha came from. So that was a good win for Terry Mahasha's program at the time. All right, let's do a little rapid fire, Jason Beatty. I'll start it out. Whose loss was worse, Gus Malzahn's loss against Navy or former UCF coach Josh Heupel's unbelievable annihilation loss to South Carolina? You know, we're talking about UCF's loss and how it takes him out of the conversation for the AAC title. Josh Heupel's loss to South Carolina takes him out of the college football playoff conversation. So. I'm going to have to lean with that one. I know they were already out of the SEC title and they would have to win that, but uh, hanging around at five in the CFP 
to drop now is is that's that's pretty bad. Mike, you noticed this, I think. What did you make of UCF walking out the field without shaking hands or singing the alma maters on Military Appreciation Day against Navy? Yeah, it was it well, that doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what UCF Athletics Director Terry Mahajer thought. And he was hot about it. He was not happy about it. Uh, I'm sure he talked to Gus Malzahn and the players about it. But, yeah, they'd set that up. Um, I don't know what happened. Obviously, it was a tough, devastating loss. But UCS players did not stick around. They didn't shake hands. Most of them just walked off the field. And Navy's, <laughs> Navy's players were there to sing the Navy alma mater. And then they were essentially the only ones in front of the UCF side singing the UCF alma mater as well. It was a bad look. For UCF all the way around. All right, should UCF want to schedule USF once UCF enters the Big 12 next year? I think so. I mean, I understand that USF uh, doesn't have an opening on their non-conference schedule the next four or five years, so it would be at least until 2027, I believe. Uh, I think when you look at Terry Mahonjo's philosophy and how it changes once the team's, uh, once UCF enters the Big 12, you want to play those regional matchups so your team doesn't have to and your fans don't have to travel as far because once you're in the Big 12, you could be going to BYU and and West Virginia and Iowa State in the same year. A game in Tampa in the Big 12 sounds pretty appetizing, I think. I'll take it a step further, Mike, though. Should UCF want USF to eventually join them in the Big 12? I Well, I, I've been on that bandwagon for years now. I thought, you know, when UCF – and USF were both trying to get into the Big 12 four or five years ago. I thought the Big 12 should take both. They could have that that I-4 corridor TV uh, 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 footprint in the middle of the state of Florida. And, yes, I think UCF should want USF in. You always want a geographic rival. That's what college football was built on, geographic rivalries. And UCF and USF, they are so alike in, in what their mission is. So, absolutely Yes, I think UCF should want USF in the Big 12. All right, I heard somebody say this after the loss to Navy. Obviously, that was UCF's second straight loss to Navy. Is Navy Gus Malzahn's Tulsa? Explain. <laughs> yeah, Josh Heupel just couldn't beat Tulsa when he was here at UCF, and it was always a frustrating loss. And I think Tulsa, leaves the, even before Josh Heupel, Tulsa was always tough for UCF. But to go 0-2 under Gus Malzahn against Navy – I'll just say this. UCF is happy they don't have to play Navy or Tulsa in the Big 12 ever again. <laughs> All right. You always have a fan of the week. Who is our UCF fan of the week? Yeah, this fan is a younger one. Uh, a mother brought her son to the game. Fans were allowed on the field afterwards. Ricky Barber uh, gave this fan in particular his game-worn gloves. I, I just love uh, that, you know, you talk about how the players felt after that game. I'm sure they were not feeling too well and fans were for definitely frustrated. But to see the smile on this kid's face uh, with the Ricky Barber gloves, I think it's a really nice thing to see. That's awesome. All right, that's going to do it for another edition of UCF Football Now. Do not forget, we drop uh, usually every Tuesday at OrlandoSentinel.com. Sometimes it's on Wednesday. Um, we also have our own YouTube channel, so tell all the UCF fans you know, all the UCF friends that you have, that there's a weekly show at OrlandoSentinel.com. Uh, we will talk to you again next week for Mike Bianchi. I'm sorry, for Jason Beatty. I am Mike Bianchi. We'll we will talk to you next week. Hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. Watch us next week on UCF Football Now.